if we move on now, we, we, we know something about the biology. Uh, Diane, can you take us through where we've gone with treatment? Uh, there's been a lot of changes in the past few years, There's I think. been a lot of changes. There's been an explosion of our understanding of the biology, thankfully, which um, has also uh, led to some treatment changes. And then there's also been a lot more treatment options just, again, in the last five years, like you've explained. You know, for years, we had this chemotherapy called streptozosin that some said definitely worked and others said definitely did not work. Um, we knew that it was toxic, but it probably had some efficacy, and certainly now the data suggests that it may be helpful. Although that's a traditional alkylating agent, and we've sort of tended to use temozolomide-based therapies as an alternative alkylating agent when needed uh, cytotoxic therapy. But I think the understanding um, of where to put these treatments, because thankfully we have so many, is still a big challenge for us that take care of pancreatic endocrine tumors. So we know in patients that have functional symptoms, as Rod said so clearly, these symptoms can be debilitating and they can really be a major quality of life issue for our patients. So thankfully with the advent of somatostatin analogs, now for a couple of decades we have them. That is first and foremost a dramatic improvement of the way that we take care of patients with functional syndromes. And so Actriotad being the first one on the market for VIPoma, it was sort of like, you know, these patients came to life, which was absolutely extraordinary that we can do that with a hormone with very little side mm -hmm. effects. I mean, that was just absolutely amazing. Um, now we have other somatostatin analogs like lanreotide that we can use for functional symptoms as well. And now we have targeted therapies. We have sinitinib, which is a VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitor, mTOR inhibitor, the everolimus, and we have cytotoxic therapies that we traditionally sort of hold for patients with high tumor burden. So we still don't know how to put them all together, but it's certainly a really exciting opportunity that we have these different treatment options to offer our patients. We're still not there. We have ways to go, but we're getting better. Absolutely. Uh, so I think we'll have an opportunity to get into the details of, of all of that yeah. as we move forward here. Um, why don't we uh, go back and, and talk a little bit about how these patients first come to us. Uh, and I actually want to go to Phil. You're a surgeon. You, you probably see these patients at an earlier stage than uh, some of us oncologists do. Um, um, well, they we diagnose? see, I guess, yeah. yeah, I agree. We see them in all, kind of all ends of the spectrum. Yeah. I mean, sometimes somebody comes in because they fell off their horse and got a CT scan and then somebody says, oh, look at all that stuff on your liver. <laughs> and they just came in for a cracked rib and had no symptoms, a silent type. Other times they present very early with the hormonally active tumors, uh, like insulinomas with hypoglycemic attacks, um, or the intractable diarrhea, the VIP, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, and so on. Um, I would say the majority of the patients we see, maybe because of the um, nature of our practice since it is a tertiary referral center, we tend to see patients much later in the stage of their disease after other things have failed uh, and they have fairly advanced disease. And then we see the ones that are very early that they just happen to be getting some kind of a GI workup for some vague complaint that had maybe had nothing to do with their pancreas and somebody sees a distal in the centimeter tumor in the pancreas and then okay now what? So. For the isolated lesions to the pancreas, I think the biggest new tool in our toolbox has been the endoscopic ultrasound. It's very good for evaluating and visualizing nodal status and tumor proximity to va vascular and biliary structures in the head of the pancreas and the body of the pancreas. It's not so great for looking at imaging in the tail of the pancreas. That's one of the weaknesses of EUS. Everybody thinks, oh, if his EUS is negative, it's not a problem. We just had a patient who had a bunch of interventions and a bunch of diagnostic uh, accumulated stack of this high of things they'd had done and the ultimate answer was the tumor, the metastasis in the liver was this big, the tumor in the tail of the pancreas was a sub-centimeter tumor and it was found with intraoperative ultrasound right on the pancreas and by palpation. So you, it's interesting because it, it sounds like you see a, a whole range of these patients coming in. We really do and so we've sort of tried to sort of sort through the thing, well, how are you gonna work these people up? So, in general, if, if we're suspecting a, a pancreatic non-exocrine neoplasm uh, and they've not had an EUS and a biopsy, then we would certainly like to get that if we can get some information, get some histologic information. Um, if they have present with metastatic disease, they get the full metastatic workup and then you can get a nice chunk of tissue to get more precise histologic data about grading and staging, KI-67, mitotic index, and all like that. Um, an Octrea scan is an important part of our workup, and now it looks like perhaps 
finding harder to find lesions, especially if you're looking for a primary, the gallium 68 scan may be the new tool in our toolbox uh, that we're now using with, as we're getting more comfortable with the scan and what it can and can't tell us. False positives from granulomatous disease is a big problem, sarcoid and so forth. Um, we, we rely on MRI to look at the liver better than the CT scan. We just find more tumors with MRI than we thought were we thought we had a you know low tumor burden on a CT scan, you get an MRI and it's it looks like Swiss cheese, which could obviously change your therapy. Um, the we do biologic markers because there's a lot of patients that do have subclinical, they have hormonally producing tumors, but not necessarily syndromic. So we do insulin, proinsulin, ghrelin, glucagon, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, and gastrin to start with. We'll also look at markers like chromogranin A, pancreastatin, and pancreatic polypeptide. And if we can find one of those that's a barometer of help us monitor biologic activity, we kind of use that so they don't have to get a CT scan every three or six months, but they can get markers every three months. And if we see some changes, then it's okay, maybe it's time to re-image if we're somebody we're following, you know, long term. So let me let me go to that point because I we're we're throwing a lot around a lot of words, KI right. sixty seven, mitotic index, a whole right. lot of hormones. Uh, so let me go to some of the other panelists and and maybe we can ask which of these markers do you find uh, most useful? Uh, we'll go up, start with Rod. Uh, which which of these various tests do you find most useful in sort of predicting the outcome and how patients are going to do? The, um, if it's a functional tumor, then I will use that particular functional marker like gastrin or insulin um, or a VIP to track it. it. It's Otherwise, I think it can be very cloudy because we can have a patient who may have a high chromogranin A value, but then we put them on a somatostatin analog and it comes down and it, it can sometimes even stay down in the face of overt progression uh, underneath the influence of the somatostatin analog. So um, generally, compared to other markers though, with chromogranin A, it, you know, trending from 100 to 200 is not a big deal. That's still a three-digit value where I'm generally looking for magnitude changes before I think there's actually a, a huge change going on. And other oncologists are not used to that. They, if they see a, you know, a CEA go from 18 to 22, that's a big alarm for them sometimes. I think there probably are a lot of differences in practice types. Pam, at your center, uh, what are the markers that you like to check and what do you, what do you count on as a, as a prognostic marker for these patients? So, um, so we typically, like Phil will do, we'll draw a panel, um, though maybe slightly different, but we'll draw a panel of markers at the beginning, really just to see if there's something that's elevated that we can follow over time as a surrogate marker of disease. Um, I don't really think any of them are prognostic. I think I'll use them, and I'll tell patients that I'll use them um, as a trend for an individual patient to follow response to treatment. I actually think the best prognostic marker is within the individual patient and looking at images to look at pace of disease growth. Um, I don't even think that KI-67 or mitotic index are perfect. I think we've all had cases where we have a very low grade or a grade one tumor with a KI-67 or one or two percent that at some point picks up speed. So it's, um, it's an imperfect system right now and I don't think we have a, a perfect marker. And Diane, I, I know at your center there's been, a, there's been an interest in KI-67 and pathologic classification. Do you have a general practice with well, regard to this issue? I mean, I do, I do tell patients that uh, I'll use three things when I first see them. Um, the first is what their cancer looks like under the microscope. So I do believe that the KI-67 at first sort of presentation can really help me guess, if you will, the biology of that disease, which I think is extremely helpful for our patients. If they have an intermediate grade pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, you know, I'm a little more worried about them. And they may think, well, I'm supposed to have this slow growing cancer and I need to sort of really uh, educate them to the best of my ability. So I do use KI-67. The second thing I look at, though, is cross-sectional imaging, like Pam said. I do not order biomarkers. I think in the absence of disease growth on imaging, um, I will absolutely not change my management. And so I always sort of challenge the why am I really doing this biomarker? Do you check them, Diane? Do you? So I, like Rod had said, I um, check biomarkers if patients have clinical symptoms that yeah. I'm worried about. Yeah. So if they have an elevated sugar, I'll check the glucagon. Mm -hmm. If their sugars are low, I'll check the insulin and pro-insulin. Yeah. I do not do a battery of tests because I'm not sure I 
completely trust them and that they're validated. And I've seen patients that said, my biomarkers were normal and no one's checked anything. And then, you know, their imaging two years later shows a ton of disease. Oh, and they create so, anxiety too where you exactly. see these little And it's just the, the false positives, exactly, potentially um, that can go with that. So from my perspective, I really try to, again, educate patients why I'm not doing that, um, but also try to space out their exams because I completely agree. Like, Many patients do not need scans more than twice a year, sometimes even once a year if they're free of disease. Yeah. So we don't need to do too many tests. You know, thankfully, the biology of our disease, for many of them, particularly the ones at lower K67, allow us the benefit of allowing our patients to live their lives, because patients live scan to scan. And sometimes I live scan to scan yeah. with them, right? I mean, right. it's always frustrating for both of us. We're all like kind of anxiety as we're going through these, those shots. So um, I think we really do have to sort of drive the clinical judgment or have the clinical judgment drive what type of camp treatments and how often we need. So this, this is not a one size fits all no, type of absolutely disease. absolutely not. Matt, can I ask another you, question absolutely. of the group? Because yeah. I think one thing that I see done fairly frequently is getting surveillance um, octreotide scans. Um, and I, I mean, I'll, I'll just say it, I don't do that. I get it kind of in the beginning maybe to determine if someone has somatostatin receptor positive disease, but I was just curious how other people are using Octrea scans and even some of the new gallium scans. So yeah, in, in our practice, uh, we'll generally at least get one to yeah. get the initial receptor status. Uh, we don't commonly uh, use those uh, for follow-up. Diane, how about you? Yeah, that's exactly. We'll do a baseline, um, mm -hmm. and we actually did a study to sort of see um, you know, if you follow with Octrea scan or cross-sectional imaging, and you know, cross-sectional imaging today, that was comparing to Octrea scan, but cross-sectional imaging is much more sensitive. Um, and I worry that, you know, over time, some of these tumors may become so-called octreotide negative, so you may not be actually picking them up if you just yeah. follow them. It's a lot more radiation. It's a lot more time for the patient because they sometimes have to go back the second and third day. Yeah. So I do think unquestionably either gallium or octrea scan should be done uh, for a baseline to test the receptor status. Um, but I generally do not do it again. Um, sometimes, though, if patients have symptoms that are outside the typical field of a cross-sectional imaging, I'll do it again if I'm worried about a lesion that may be again sort of in the arm or in the leg or something else that um, may be concerning to me that maybe they're, you know, again, and that's particularly in patients with very large volume disease to begin with. Yeah. But I think it's unlikely in patients with yeah. low volume.